Good morning and happy Sunday, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> My name is uh, Lavinia Patrick. I am the minister here at Mama Grace, and I'd like to welcome you all to our Sunday worship. Today is the 18th Sunday of the Pentecost. It's always a joy and a privilege for us to come together and worship God together this morning. As a reminder that no matter who you are, and no matter where you are in your life's journey, all of you are welcome to this space. And as always, we start our morning by going and passing the peace of Christ to each other and recognizing God's presence in each other's faces and just greeting each other and checking on each other in our own very special way. How about we do that this morning? Just go around and say good morning to the person next to you or say, Jambo, I see you this morning. Let's go around and do that real quick as we welcome each other to worship this morning. Day is beautiful and uh, it sounds like a really nice day um, today. And in our announcements this week, just most of it is always a reminder to continue to pray uh, for some of our church members, um, particularly uh, Ms. Judy, um, Larry Edwards, and uh, the uh, Gideon's family, those three, and particularly uh, those of us even within the congregation who have one or two problems here and there that need prayers. I want to encourage us to, if you have any prayer requests and you really want us to pray for you about uh, whatever that problem is, you can always submit it to me or any of those in the worship team. Or if you're not comfortable, you can just write it on a paper and just drop it with any of those in the worship team or myself and we continue to pray for you. So we encourage you to submit any prayer request if you have any. Or those who are not able to join us, if you, I don't know how you could do that, submit on email or a phone call to me or... I can provide uh, my phone number, and then a reminder as always that the soap meetings are still there every last Sunday. It's an opportunity for you to meet and have conversations about what's going on in your lives outside of the church, but also talk about ministries and possibilities of ministries within the context of the United States and outside of the, the U.S. And so we encourage you to join the soap meetings every last Sunday of the month. And um, just to uh, say that um, there's going to be a church conference, uh, which is next month on the 5th. Uh, it has it, uh, just my calendar, uh, it's also just a reminder. And uh, something I want to say today is that for those of us who might have uh, special hymns, hymnals that you sang and you think we need to keep singing them, just to remind you of the good old days, and if you have any favorite hymns, please, uh, you're welcome to let me know. I think I'll be happy for us to sing hymns that folks are familiar with. So if you have any hymns in the United Methodist Hymnal that you think uh, you haven't sung in a long time and you think could be a good suggestion for our Sunday worship, please let me know um, and I'll do as much as possible to accommodate everybody's request. So please, if you have any hymn songs that you, you have memories of or you enjoy them, let me know and I can have them incorporated in our services as we go along. So, Please feel free. There are no bad hymns. I encourage you to let me know. Um, so it's now time for our praise and worship this morning. I'd like to invite our praise and worship team to come forward and lead us in worship this morning. If you're able, please join us as we worship God together this morning.
together this morning. God has called us to his table of grace where love and mercy are freely given. We come seeking his presence and desire to share in his feast. God calls us not because we are worthy, but because of his grace. We come with our hearts grateful for the invitation. And in the kingdom of God, everyone is invited. But we must come prepared, clothed in righteousness. We come to surrender ourselves to be transformed by the Spirit. 
Let us worship the one who invites us, the God who welcomes us to the journey of life. We come ready to receive and ready to worship our God. Amen. While well, standing, I invite you to join me as we sing our opening hymn this morning, Blessed Assurance. You can find that in United Methodist hymn of page 369. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's sing together. Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who had a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, 
I have prepared dinner, my oxen and my fatted calf have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. <laughs> they made light of it and went away, <clears throat> one to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burnt their cities. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Whose slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so that the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. The king said to the attendant, Find him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you very much, Mr. Steve, for such a wonderful and beautiful reading this morning. Now is the time for Children's Corner, which is an opportunity for me to speak to us here and our children. And we do not have any children in our uh, present right now, but if you have any children who are watching us online today, I'd like to let you know that all of you are welcome here in the morning, wherever you are, and we're happy that you're worshiping with us this morning. I'd like to start off our story this morning by asking a very simple question. How many of us either have sent an invitation, for those of us who are married, sent an invitation for a wedding, or have received an invitation for a wedding here? How many of us? Awesome, so that's a lot of us. How many of us haven't received any invitation for a wedding? Seems like everybody has received some kind of invitation, or an invitation for a birthday party. How many have sent out or have received an invitation for a birthday party? Oh, that's awesome. And can you share with us how it felt? So this, I want it to be a little bit more interactive today. For those who have received invitation, how have it felt for you when you received an invitation from somebody? Was it, was it a feeling of excitement or a feeling of nervousness? How does it feel for you to receive an invitation for those who have received invitations? How does it feel? Exciting. Exciting. Great. Uh, for those of us who haven't received you were disappointed. So basically, I know that the response will be disappointment. You expected an invitation, but you never got it. How many of us? For something, either a birthday party or an interview, some kind of invitation. Yeah, we have Mr. Rich, so thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it feels a little bit disappointing, and sometimes can be a little bit nerve wracking like you were expecting, and you keep expecting, but you just never get it. Um, so there's a contrast between those who have received an invitation and those who have not received an invitation. And how many have sent an invitation and the people you sent out, the invitation never came? Maybe for whatever reason. How, how does it feel? Does it feel bad, good? How do you feel about sending That's invitations? Situation because in our family, people just don't get along. Oh, so for all kinds of reasons. And so. Yeah. That is a lot there. So the reason why I'm bringing up the issue around invitation, and for those who are watching online, is because um, these are common things that happen in our lives. And so in today's story, Jesus is being confronted by religious leaders. And Jesus is somebody who always has to find ways to navigate uh, questions without sometimes really directly giving the right answer. And the way he does this, it's called a parable. In a parable, by definition, for some people, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus is asked, where did you get your authority from? And so all the scribes and Sadducees and Pharisees, all these big religious leaders, were not happy about Jesus because he has all these gatherings of crowd who are excited about what he has to say. And these religious leaders who originally have this crowds are not feeling jealous and not feeling so good about Jesus. And so they begin to probe him and ask this question, where do you even get your authority from? And why are there so many people who are following you and trying to listen to you? And so for Jesus, he didn't want to come confront them and just tell them where his authority is coming from or tell them what the real answer is. So he leaves them with this story. 
It tells them a story about a king. So there was a king whose son was going to have a wedding, uh, was supposed to have, supposedly has a wedding. And so this king had sent an invite to all kinds of people. They've accepted this invitation. Now the time has come for the wedding, but the king, as the king, as those of us who know, a normal wedding is, can be big, but imagine it's a wedding that a king is inviting people. And for those of us who followed the news, there was a recent wedding in India where there's the billionaire who invites Bill Gates and all these kinds of people. But in this, similar, in this story, we see that the king invites people, and now he wants to send a reminder to these people. And so he sends his uh, servant to go to these people and remind them that you've received this invitation, the wedding is now, please come. The, the, the wedding is, is here, come for the wedding. And so when he sends his uh, servant to this, this uh, people that he sent an invitation to, uh, some of the servants uh, went to a, a person, some people, and some people said, we have farm work to do, we're not able to make it. He went to, some of them went to another guy, and the other guy says, you know, I have a business to do, I have a business to run, I don't think I can make it to this wedding. And for some of the servants, they went to other, other uh, invitees, other people that were invited, and actually they got the, 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 the wrong end of the stick. They were bitten, and the, the, the other people bit them up and uh, actually injured them. And so the servants came back with the news and told the king what had happened, that a lot of the people that he uh, sent the invitation actually declined to come to this, in, uh, this wedding that he had planned, a big, grand wedding. And so what does the king do? He decides that, well, all of these people that I sent an invitation and they refuse to come, now what do I do? So he says, tells his servant what you can do, it really is go out on the street and just any random person you meet, let them come invite them to the wedding. And so he sends this invitation randomly now to just anybody on the street. And luckily, as you think about how this will play out in real life, you, you invite people you know and they don't show up, and then you invite other people. Now what's interesting is this wedding has a lot of food. So if you invited just random people on the streets, it means that they will be able to make it to the wedding. But anyway, the people made it to the wedding and the wedding happened. And so one of the interesting part of the story is that in the wedding, when this, all these people that were invited, it was either the people were good or bad, it didn't matter what their status was because again, it's a wedding that it's about a king, so you would invite people of high status. But when all these people refuse, this all these high status people refuse to come, this king sends out an invite to ordinary people, whether they were good or bad or whatever kinds of people, all kinds of people, regardless of where they are. They showed up at this wedding, and something incredibly happened, something interesting happened during the wedding. The king noticed that there was somebody at this wedding party who was not properly dressed for a wedding. He was not dressed in a good way. And so the king was not very happy as the story goes, and the king decided that, why is, ask the person, why is he dressed this way? There's no good answer for it. And so the king decides that they take this person and throw this person out of the wedding venue. Now this story is a story that talks about something very interesting that I'll talk about later in my sermon. It's about grace. This story has been used multiple times to talk about how God's grace first started with Abraham and the people of Israel and how it extended now to everybody. The invitation was sent to a particular group of people, but then this particular group of people didn't have to listen to the invitation. And this invitation now extended to everybody. And so if you're here listening today, I have been to weddings before in my life. One of the things that growing up in Nigeria was that you never get to the real wedding, but when it was time for food as kids, you always had an opportunity to sit, sneak into the, the banquet where the, the food is and people that allow you to come in. So there was much more fun that comes into that. And so the story today really is about grace. God's grace is for all persons. God invites all of us, whether we're good or bad, God invites all of us to partake in His way of being and in partake in this life, life-giving moments that He has created all of us so that we can enjoy all the beautiful things that He has created in this world. Now the one person who was not dressed properly for that wedding, it meant that even though God's invitation for grace is for all of us, we have to dress properly and that dressing is righteousness. Because God's grace, because we have God's grace does not mean we don't have to be righteous. It means that even though we have God's grace, that invitation, 
that God is calling each and every one of us as children of God, that we also have to play our own role. And by playing our own role, we have to do the right things. Because oftentimes when we hear the word grace, people think it means you could do whatever you want. But God also says that while I'm inviting all of you to come to this banquet, this party, this feast, I also require you to do good things, and that is righteousness. But that one person who came to this wedding, he didn't stick with the dress code for that wedding. There was some kind of at least some kind of uh, requirement which was righteousness, and he didn't stick to that, and he got thrown out of that party. And so, if there are children today watching us, and if there are people here thinking about the word grace and the story of a king and what was going on in the story, think about the idea of grace that all of us are welcome to be part of God's kingdom. All of us are welcome to be called children, sons and daughters of God. But God requires us to wear that clothing of righteousness. God requires us to do good things, to love, work humbly, be kind to our neighbors, be kind to the people around us, respect our parents, and be good citizens of our country, our neighborhood, our community. I pray that God will give us the strength as children and people of God to respect God's invitation and clothe ourselves in righteousness. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for our story this morning, and we thank you for our children, those children who might be watching us, and children by heart who are here this morning. As we have listened to the story of the wedding feast of the king and the son and all the invite, invitees and all that had happened in this story, remind us of your grace and love for all of us, regardless of our status, regardless of how we think, regardless of who we are. But most importantly, we remind our children to do the right thing because doing the right things is a way to uh, be righteous and be willing to, to accept this invitation but do the things that God calls us to do. Bless our parents, bless our children. We pray this in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to invite you to join me as we sing Jesus Loves Me together this morning. to those weddings. And as you can imagine, 
because it was a time when tradition was held very highly, that would have been a very, very big event. And so invitations from a king would be unthinkable, but also insulting if you refuse to go. And so in Jesus' time, the kind of rejection that we hear from this story is not something that would have sat well with the king. Jesus tells a parable as part of a series of teachings about the kingdom of heaven. The parable was because people were asking him about where his authority came from. The people were asking him because they thought he was taking in a lot of the crowds that they always had by their sides. And so he starts off this parable by saying that there was a king. There was a king who wanted to throw a wedding banquet for his son's wedding. And so this king sends a beautifully crafted invitation to all the important people in the kingdom. But then to his surprise, being the king, to his surprise, this people that he had crafted all these wonderful invitations did not show up. And so one by one, each of them made excuses. They were too busy with work. Some of them were too busy in their farms. Some of them were too busy in their businesses. And some of them even treated the king's messengers very badly. Ignoring the king and maltreating or mistreating the messengers. The king wasn't happy because, again, this is a king. And back in the day, kings held power. And so the king is angry, but he doesn't cancel the feast. He has to find an alternative to this. And so instead, he decides that he would send his servants into the streets, into the alleyways to invite everyone whether they were rich, whether they were poor, whether they were young, whether they were old, from whatever walks of life, he said, I want them to be part of this feast because all the important people, for me, have refused and have declined my invitation. And so he sends this invite to just anybody, anybody randomly in the streets, and the banquet hall is now filled with people, and the celebration begins. But then, as the king was walking among his guests, as you know, you invite people to a wedding, you have to go around and greet them and, and check with them. How is the wedding party going? And for those of us who have hosted parties or uh, dinners in our homes, when you invite people, you gotta go around and check with them. I, do you need a fill up of a drink? Do you like this drink? Do you like the food? You gotta ask them questions. And so the king was doing what normal people do when you invite people to a wedding or a banquet or a dinner or a birthday, any kind of party at your place. And so he notices that there was someone who wasn't wearing the proper wedding attire or the wedding clothes. And this person came to the party, but he didn't come prepared for the celebration. And so the king asked him why, but the man unfortunately did not have a good answer as to why he was dressed the way he was dressed. And so the king had to remove him from this banquet. The king didn't feel good about this man's way of approaching the ceremony. It was a free invite, free meal, free food, free music, free everything. All, you require, all the things you required to do to be part of this grandeur of a ceremony was just to dress modest and dress in the attire of clothing. It kind of reminded me of my upbringing back home in Nigeria. When there was a wedding, you gotta have some kind of dress. And this dress was more traditional. And I remember sometimes I would say to myself, maybe I shouldn't wear this dress. But my mom would be like, well, nobody's going to allow you into that wedding place with whatever dress you have. you got to dress like the people. And I think even till today, some of these traditions still hold. So it's no surprise that this king would tell this person who wasn't dressed in the right attire to move out or be thrown out of the wedding. <clears throat> One of the things we often forget or we choose to ignore is that the gospel story is also a challenging message. Sometimes when we hear the parables, we think that the parables are always, always going to be good stories with happy ending. Jesus talked more about money, riches, and how we should give them away than any other subject when he begins to talk about the kingdom of God. 
And so in the same way, we can picture ourselves living in eternity in God's favor, but sometimes we choose to ignore the fact that we actually need to live our lives as Christ followers. Our experiences can be quite different, but we have to be Christ followers. This individual in the story did not follow the instruction to go to this banquet and this wedding. And so this story has a lot for us to, un to, to unpack this morning. Prior to telling of this parable, Jesus has been challenged by the religious leaders as to, the source, as to where the source of his authority came from. And so the parable is part of Jesus' response to their challenge. And in essence, Jesus' message is that those of you who think have authority, or those of you who think you have authority in your life, while you think you have authority, sometimes you seemingly do not have the authority you think you have. And so as he begins to tell this parable, we quickly understand that the king throwing the wedding banquet somehow represents God in this story. And as the parable once unfolds, we see two lists of invitees to the banquet. People who represent uh, individuals who were the chosen people of God and people who just came as outsiders in the story. And sometimes when you listen to this story, this story has been used as a source of anti-Semitism. And I think it is completely unnecessary when we think about this story. And I think we would better understand this story when we think about the story from a broader context of the story rather than the chosen people of God refusing to accept God's invite and then God sends invites to the Gentiles. You see, kings had servants that they had to send out for an invitation for all kinds of different guests. And tradition would have it to, uh, for us to believe that the guests in the story that were invited later on after the people, the chosen people, or the big people of the, the, the big people that were invited in the first place, tradition would have it that the new people that came into the story were Gentiles. But I think the broader view is appropriate. And I think when we think about the secondary guests, we think about people who have no prior relationship with God. They are people who never really have any relationship with God. When the king sent out the invite, he sent out the people he knew, people who were in, in his circle, and they refused to accept this invitation. And when he sends out the second invitation, he sends out to people he had no contact with. And how you can see that story and how you can interpret that story is that these are people who have prior, who do not have any prior encounter with God, but God still offers an invitation to them. How about that, right? God still offers an invitation to them. This guest graciously then accepts God's invitation even though they have no contact. This guest, secondary guest that were invited, they didn't, know that they didn't have any contact with the king, but when the, the invitation came, he said, anybody can just come. They were willing. So they accepted, graciously accepted the invitation. But then the king appears to see how things are going, and he discovers that there is, even in the secondary guest, there is somebody who is not appropriately dressed. So we might speculate that the mistressed guest did not own the appropriate clothing, or he could not afford that. But that is a little consequence because the king asked the man, why is he not dressed appropriately? I mean, if he, if you think about the guy who was thrown out of the wedding banquet and he's not dressed appropriately, one of the things that can come to mind is what if he didn't have the money to afford the clothing or what if he didn't have the right clothing? But remember in the story, as we read the story, the king asked him, why are you not dressed appropriately? And he gave absolutely no explanation why he was not dressed appropriately. It almost seemed as if he did not really care it almost seems as if he did not put in his own work. Because if I showed at a party to Mr. Steve's party or Mr. Leach or David's party, and he said, wear black and white and I'm wearing green, what do I do if they ask me, why are you wearing green? Or perhaps I forgot, I was in a party, I went to a job. Or, there has to be some kind of explanation. Or I'm sorry, I forgot. Or maybe I just don't have a green shirt. But in this story, this particular guest did not give an explanation. And so that would mean that he really didn't care because there got to be some kind of explanation why you are dressed or misdressed or dressed improperly. And so the king throws this 
undressed uh, guests into the outer darkness. And there, in the story, we hear that in the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And all we can think to ourselves is, where is the grace then? At least he showed up. There was a grace that said, you know, everybody is invited. So this guy shows up. And at least when he showed up, he, this guy who came undressed, in his case, he didn't even murder the king's uh, king servant. Remember, the first guest, the primary guest, some of them murdered the king's servant. But this guy did not even do anything. He didn't murder them. He was just undressed. The problem is, even on the nature of his dressing, he gets thrown out of the wedding. And all he did was that he dressed wrong, the wrong way, and he gets thrown out. And so the question is, where is the grace in this story? That's the question I want us to consider today. Because you see, the way we read this parable, it's all about God's grace and appropriate response on our part. And in order to frame our thinking about how this works in this parable, I wanted us to share, I want us to look at how John Wesley, who is the founder of Methodism, talks about grace. Wesley, who was important in the Methodist movement, defined grace in different ways. Wesley thought a lot about grace, and one of the distinguishing features of Wesley's teaching about grace is that it can be divided into three distinct parts. Wesley's definition of grace is that it can be divided into three distinct parts. First, there is prevenient grace, which is preventing grace. And then secondly, there is justifying grace. And thirdly, there is sanctifying grace. And if you think about this concept, you think about it as a house. There's prevenient grace, there's justifying grace, and there's sanctifying grace. And for you to be able to understand these three types of, well, uh, three distinguishing features of grace, you think about this as a house. Prevenient grace, if you think about it as a house, prevenient grace is that porch, right? That chair that sits outside of the house. So those of us have a house where you have a porch or some kind of chair that just sits outside of the outside of your house, right? It's outside. Anyone can walk up to it. In, 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 anyone, any random person can walk up to that porch or that chair that you randomly put in your house and they can walk up to it. They can sit on it. No, nothing's gonna happen. At least if you are somebody, if you're somebody who is open to people come into your house and just relaxing. The, at the front of your house, the porch, is the prevenient grace, right? Think about these three features as a house. At the front of your house, you have a porch, and anyone can walk up to that porch, right? Anyone can go there. In the same way, God's prevenient grace is available to all people, no matter what. It's God's way at work in our lives before we even are aware of who God is. That is prevenient grace. And that is why everyone is loved by God. So when you think about prevenient grace, everyone is invited to God's love, to God's presence, even before they know God. And that is how prevenient grace works. Now, to continue the house analogy, justifying grace, then, which is another feature, the second feature is like the door that opens from the porch to inside of the house. So you think about prevenient grace, which is the porch, the, uh, you know, before in, at the front of your house, you have a seat where anybody can just sit when they're tired of walking around the house. You just sit. Anyone can do that. Now, for somebody to go into the house, they've got to be able to open the door. And so that comes justifying grace. Justifying grace is that door that leads into the house, right? So that door, you've got to pass through the porch, and then that door allows you to go into the house. Now, though all people can walk onto the porch, not all people are able to enter your house. Now, you begin to scream, right? You begin to scream. You just don't want anybody to enter your house. One could be a murderer. One could, you begin to think about who can come into your house. Because not all of us can just open our doors to everybody. While it is good to be welcoming to all persons, sometimes you've got to be careful. That is why people have ways of looking at the camera, looking at the camera to make sure who is at the door, just to make sure it's, it's, it's a little bit safe. So think about justifying grace as, as the door that leads into the house. Justifying grace is the grace that changes us when we make a decision to commit our lives to God in Christ Jesus. Even though God invites all of us, but we got to make a commitment to change our lives. Let's say you make a friend with somebody who is not a good person, but you in yourself, you're a good person. Do you want to keep go, walking around with somebody who is not good? Do you want to make sure that they make a commitment when they're with you, maybe not be bad, or maybe make a commitment to 
work towards changing themselves. And so you can think about justifying grace as that grace that changes us when we make the decision to commit our lives to Jesus Christ. You can liken it to being born again, and that is what justifying grace is. This born again experience or changing when we say we want to get baptized and now we begin to start experiencing that justifying grace. Again, think about it. Revenian grace is the porch. Justifying grace is the door that leads to the house. And so while Revenian grace is available to all persons even before the knowing, justifying grace is saying you have to make a commitment to say I want to walk this journey with Christ. I want to commit my life to Christ. And so finally, the third feature of John Wesley's idea of grace is the sanctifying grace, which is the grace that is constantly at work in our lives, helping us grow in our relationship with God and in our Christ-likeness. Now, justifying grace, you have made that commitment that I have decided to follow Jesus. I want to be with Jesus. I want to be baptized. I want to commit my life. I want to make a change. You have made that decision. That is justifying grace. Now, when you think about sanctifying grace, it is that grace now that is constantly at work in our lives, helping us after we've made that decision, helping us grow in relationship with Christ. And so to use that half analogy again, sanctifying grace is more like the stairways in the house that leads you up and down in the house. If you have a house that you have two floors, now sanctifying grace, you need that stairways to go up the second floor and come down the second floor. So that grace is the one that allows you to go back and forth up and down. It helps you maintain your relationship with God. Because again, justifying grace says, I have committed, I've made a commitment here. But you need another grace to help you to continue that journey up and down. It's going to be up and down, obviously. And so sanctifying grace is that one that allows you the stairways in the house. Justifying grace is the one that allows you into the house. Sanctifying grace, the stairways. Prevenient grace is that force that is outside of your house. So that is the future of John Wesley's idea of grace. And so prevenient grace is that grace that goes before us. Think about it. It goes before us. Even before we know it, it is available to all people. Justifying grace is that grace that moves us from our old self into covenant life with God. And sanctifying grace is the grace by which we grow in our Christ like it likeness when we commit ourselves to God. So it is important that we know here that John Wesley thought that we would backslide. And so because we would backslide, that is why we have the sanctification. We have the sanctifying grace to help us when we backslide, when we go up the stairways and we come down, we need to still go up. We can still have that sanctifying grace to help us go up. And so some people may renounce their faith and find themselves in places where they go back to that front couch, right? You renounce your faith or, you faith or you sin, and you find yourself outside of your door of the house. Again, think about the house analogy. You still have an opportunity to be able to open the door and go back into it. And that is the best possible way you can think about grace. Grace says that you have, in, you have been invited, you have open access to God even before you know it. But you've got some work to do by yourself. So the thing is, even though we may backslide, we will never fall from grace. Because this is your house, right? Grace is always there. Think about it, it's a house. It is your house. Even though you fall, you still have access to that. You cannot fall away from grace. Grace is always there. And so because God's prevenient grace is always still moving and working in our lives, you just never can fall away from grace. However, if we make the decision never to enter the door, or when we backslide in a degree that we don't want to go back into the go back into the house and just stay at the front porch, then we start missing out on the abundant life that God gives to us. That possible life, that possible relationship with God, we begin to miss out on it when we don't ask for uh, the, the, the if we when we don't open the door into the house, then we begin to miss out on that. And so that is some things that I want you to think about when you think about God's grace. You might want to think about what about some of the guests, you know, that are some of the guests that come in, try to come into the house illegally. Well, this in this concept of grace, there's no way you can do it illegally. You gotta go through Jesus Christ. You gotta come through this God who is called Jesus. You gotta do it the right way. Even though prevenient grace is for everybody, you gotta do it through Jesus Christ. But God's grace seems to be limited to a few, you would think. But really, that is not the case. Whether you are a Christian, whether you're a Muslim, that prevenient grace is open to all kinds of people. Jesus tells us that the wedding banquet was full of all kinds of guests. These people had to be welcome to the movement of God's grace in their life. 
they have to step up to, up to the front porch and then they had to enter into the presence of the king. They had to accept the invitation, come to the wedding, and then now they're in front of the king and they can make their case or have that interaction with God. In other words, the guest walked into the king's presence, but this, uh, this particular guest that was not dressed properly, even though he accepted the invite, walked up into the king's presence, he walked into this house, but his life has not been changed. And so this is the common metaphor for the New Testament, that we think about the garment to represent uh, a life that is changed and a relationship with God. This particular guest has chosen not to change. And to the king, that means that his life has not changed. He does not really desire to be there. Even though he accepted the invitation, he did not make effort. He did not desire to, want, even though he wanted to go to, seems like he wanted to go to his wedding, but to the king, it really doesn't matter because you are not ready to be there if you are not dressed correctly. And so the king has to throw him back into the porch again. Think about the porch analogy, the outer darkness, apart from the, 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 the king throws him back. So there's a, there's, there's a possibility for him to be able to get back into that house again and over and over again. So if you think about, it, about all of this, there are two lessons that we need to think about in the story and the connection to our knowledge of the, the house. That we are not apart from God because of God's prevenient grace. That somehow we are always connected to God because of God's prevenient grace. We may choose to stay in that place. We may choose not to change our lives. We may choose to backslide. We may still to remain still. We may choose to just even remain still and not make any progress. But even though we want to be stubborn, even though we want to continue our broken lives as sinners, God in His infinite grace will continue to reach out to us, calling us into His presence, calling us to come, calling us, giving us that ability to come to that front porch. Whether we choose to respond, it is entirely up to us to make that decision. You can discern from this parable the consequences of not responding. Those people who did not respond to the invitation, what happened to them? They missed out on the big party, the banquet, the banquet. They missed out on it. They missed out on the music, the interaction with the king, uh, the food, the uh, building even relation, meeting new friends. Who knew this? Other people met new friends. And, experience something different. Those people who did not respond to the invitation missed out on a lot of things. And so there lies the second lesson that if we do choose to respond to God's invitation of grace to step through the door of justification into the king's presence, which is God's presence, then it means our lives must be changed. If, they, if we want to accept that invitation, then we must change our lives. We don't have to carry our old clothing. We don't have to be dressed like that guy or be misdressed like the guy who went to the wedding without the right proper attire for that wedding. If you are choosing the invitation to come to this king's presence, then you must be willing to make adjustments to your life. You must be willing to change for the good. You must be willing to continue to reach out to God and ask God to help you so that you can continue to respond to that call. Friends, you have to think about the idea of grace as one that continues to invite us where we got work to do, but also even when we do the work, God is continuously helping us to continue that work in our lives. Grace is something that is, is freely given to all of us. We get grace because God loves all people. And some people put it this way. They, that, to think about grace, that some people want a safe and soft side of discipleship. So they shy away from the most difficult work of outreach, social justice. They want God's blessing, but they cannot share God's work in the world. They want God's blessing, but they're not willing to do God's work in the world. They want God to come to them, but they're not willing to come to God. They want God to be part of their lives, but they're not willing to accept God's invitation. And that is the problem. Even though grace is abundant, grace is for all persons. We got to be willing to do the work, which is to accept the invitation and also be dressed properly for that event. They want the world hunger to end, but they do not want to miss a meal to make a contribution to the world. Think about that, right? You want to do great stuff, you're not willing to make the sacrifice that can lead to that great stuff. And that's how we think about grace and our relationship with God. Living in God's presence means, friends, to live differently. To live differently from the way we used to live that is not great the invitation has gone out for all of us the invitation has gone out for me you all the people who may not be here today the invitation is out like the king just has sent that invitation jesus came to the world the invitation has gone out all you need to do is 
Are you willing to accept that invitation? The question is, can you manage to have the right outfit to put that invitation or put that party into your schedule? Those people, some of them have other things. They said, we've got other things to do. They accepted, they seem to have accepted the invite, but somehow their schedule couldn't allow them to fit that wedding into their lives. And so they missed out. God's grace is calling each and every one of us. This is about a new life, friends. It's about a new life in Christ Jesus. It's about a new life. Are you willing to respond to that call, that invitation? I want to end with a story. There was once a poor man who wandered into a tailor's shop. He admired the beautiful suits hanging on the racks, but he knew he couldn't afford them. And so the tailor seeing this man's one of clothes offered to make him a suit for free. So this man was all one. He woke up with the tailor. He was not thinking the tailor was going to make a clothes for him, but the tailor looks at his one of clothes. The tailor said, I'm going to make the clothing for you. And so this man that walked into the tailor's shop was overwhelmed with gratitude. And he said, well, if it's free, I'm going to accept it, right? He accepts it. However, when the tailor took the man's measurement, you notice that the man kept slouching in and shrinking back. You know how, like, somebody's, if, if I'm measuring your shoulder, you could easily go this way or you can try to shrink. So when the tailor was measuring this man's measurement, doing the man's measurement, you notice that the man kept shrinking back and trying to make himself smaller. And for this man, what he was thinking really was he didn't want to cost the tailor a lot of yams or a lot of material, clothing material. Because the bigger you are, the more clothing somebody used to make your clothing, right? So this is free, so he's trying to shrink himself to make sure he's not costing the tailor a lot of money. So the tailor gently told him, just stand tall. I am making a suit for who you can be, not for who you wear or who you are right now. I think in the same way, God's grace is not about who we wear or who we are right now, but who we are becoming in Christ. That is the invitation today. The question is, are we ready to stand tall like this man? This man thought he was doing justice or trying to help this tailor by shrinking himself, but the tailor was willing to do anything possible. The tailor was willing to spend all kinds of material to make sure that this man has enough clothing, even when he grows taller, even when he gains a little bit of weight or whatever that is, that he has enough clothes to sustain him into the future. When you think about that, are you willing to accept that invitation that God is offering for us because Christ knows that we can become who he wants us to be. We need to accept that invitation. So are we ready to stand tall? Are we ready to put on that wedding garment of transformation, transform our lives to be better persons and to live differently in God's presence like those other people who are dressed properly in the presence of God, of, of the King. Are we willing to live differently? Are we willing to choose a life that allows us to walk up and down the stairs in the analogy that I give you? That is what God's grace says to us. The invitation is there. God's grace is abundant. Like they tell you, there's enough clothing. There's enough clothing. God can see you more clothes for you. And so all we need to do is to respond to that call. And that might make a difference in our lives and the lives of the people around us. May God help us to be joyous and not only hear us of God's word. Amen. 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 It's now time for our offering of tithes and thanks for this morning. I invite you to stand up and join us to sing together this morning. <coughs> with grateful hearts, honoring your enduring guidance and grace in our lives. Just as wisdom works with willing hands and provides for those in need, may this gift be used to nurture and uplift our community. 
Inspire us, O oh God, to follow your teachings of kindness and generosity. Transform our contributions into acts of love and justice, spreading your light in our world. May we always give credit to your divine wisdom and grace. We pray this in your holy name this morning. Amen. Friends, it's our time for closing hymn this morning. It's I am dying, O Lord. You can find that in the Methodist hymnal, page 419. Join me as we sing together our closing hymn. That is sanctifying grace. But also, when we backslide, we get out of the house, it's still our house. That porch is still there. We can rest and try to open the door again and get back to it. So grace does not mean that we're exempted from righteousness. It just means that we have access to God. And that access allows us to go back and forth because God knows that it's going to be difficult. This life is going to be difficult. And so when you hear somebody give you grace as a justification for the sin that they commit. Tell them you've got to still be transformed. You've got to be sanctified because God's grace needs us to do work. Even though God is helping us maintain that relationship, 
There's work that needs to be done in our part. We have free invitation to the king's party, but we gotta dress correctly. We gotta come rightly dressed, not misdressed. And even when we are misdressed, and the king asks us, why are you wearing yellow when we said white? Maybe give an explanation to the king. That is where prayer comes in. Pray to God and ask God to forgive and help you. Let us pray. As you go forth from this place, may you carry with you the joy of knowing that God has extended his invitation to each and every one of you. May your hearts be open to say yes to his call and his will. May you live each day clothed in grace, love, and passion for all persons. Go now into the world sharing the invitation of Christ's love with all the people you meet. And may the peace of God and the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever and always. Amen. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for worshiping with us, those who are new and those who have been here with us. There's going to be fellowship. Um, there's food, free food for everybody. So please stay by and enjoy. And I hope you all have a blessed week. And thank you for being with us this morning and those worshiping online. You have a blessed week. And remember to stay blessed and stay warm and enjoy the grace that God gives to all of us. God bless you. Amen. Amen.